Hello everyone. Greetings in Jesus' name. You're through to St Mark's Online. And this video uploaded for Sunday, the 28th of April, AD 2024. I'm Jonathan Fraze. Thank you for joining me. On an occasion when I look back on Thursday, which is St Mark's Day, the 25th, and we're transferring that theme to this video service now. I must warn you, I ask that uh, you forgive me because I'm likely to cough several times. I've got a tickle, but I've got a glass of water handy to see if that helps me through. Let's start with half a hymn. The King of Love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine, forever. Where streams of living water flow, my ransomed soul he leadeth. And where the verdant pastures grow, with food celestial feedeth. Perverse and foolish oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me. And on his shoulder gently laid, and home rejoicing, brought to me. Well, as that silly sheep now recovered, let's admit our shortcomings. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy on us, spare those who confess their faults, restore those who repent as you have promised, through Jesus Christ our Lord, and grant, O merciful Father, for his sake, that we may live a godly, righteous and disciplined life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Mighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Collect for the fourth after Easter. Almighty God, you alone can order the unruly wills and passions of sinful men. Grant that your people may love what you command and desire what you promise, so that among the many and varied changes of this world, our hearts may be firmly fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're still working our way through Psalm 18, and this section must supremely be true of Jesus. Verses 20 to 24. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not done evil by turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him and have kept myself from sin. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Thanks be to God. Our main reading, 1 Peter 5. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. 
Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greeting, and so does my son Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable now and always in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I am a materialist. I enjoy the ability to touch things and examine them, to taste food, to see useful or beautiful objects, to smell a pleasant fragrance and to hear the sounds in God's created world. And I look forward to the next material world, at what Jesus called in Matthew 19, verse 28, the renewal of all things. The new heavens and the new earth will bring the physical and material experience of this world, but without the consequences of the fall. So, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain or earthquakes or famines or tsunamis or droughts for the old order of things will have passed away. The Christian vision of the future is awe-inspiring. We look forward to this in the creeds when we declare belief in the resurrection. For instance, in the Apostles' Creed, we say that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church. That's Catholic with a small c, meaning universal. So that's our new family. And we say we believe in the communion of saints. That's our new history. Those who knew God's grace in past years. We believe in the forgiveness of sins. That's the new beginning, the fresh start. And we say we believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's the new future. And finally, the life everlasting, our new quality of spiritual life, in which heaven invades and fills the soul. The Nicene Creed, a longer one which, which we use at Holy Communion, says that we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So, what will it be like being resurrected in a renewed world? Jesus showed us in his miracles, each one being a taster of the new world. It will be the calm after the storm, the freedom after the exorcism, the relief after healing, the reunion after raising from the dead. Oh, the wonder of Christ recreating Eden wherever he walked. But he will now do this on a cosmic scale. We will be lost in wonder, love and praise, as the hymn Love Divine puts it, with its prayer and vision to finish then my new creation. The resurrection, you see, means that we will feel the pleasures of heaven. And once we get there, none of us will regret missing out on experiences on earth. The Creator God intentionally made a material world and now recreates us morally and spiritually as a foretaste of the new physical creation of the planet. As we travel through this disordered world, 
the Bible records workmen such as shepherds, like Abraham, Joseph, and Moses, and David, who was also a musician, as well as men skilled in leather, like Paul the tent maker, and wood, such as Noah, oh, and Jesus himself. And let us add Tabitha, the seamstress, from Acts 9. And is there anything more material than the business of bringing a child into the world? The effect is that we respect the created world and use our bodies for good. Self-control for us, love for our neighbour, and careful stewardship of the environment are basic for Christian lifestyle. As a sign in a dental practice puts it, you don't have to brush all your teeth just the ones you want to keep. If God is creator, then I'm interested, you see, in it all, as a keeper. So why is materialism a bad word today? Hey, you know, it gets listed alongside bad things such as hedonism, living merely for pleasure, narcissism, being totally preoccupied with yourself, syncretism, blending religion so that yours loses all distinctive quality all isms that will one day, thankfully, be wasms. Actually, materialism can refer to either of two mistakes. One is the belief that nothing exists except what I can feel and be scientifically proven. This used to be really trendy. But if you want the scientific proof for being able to recreate a result in the laboratory, then you must forsake all of history. And if you accept only what you examine under a microscope, then relationships are a real problem for you. Materialism simply doesn't fit the real world. Modern medicine has thus moved on from the insistence that we are mind and body alone to recognise that there is something more which is fundamental to our being and ought to be factored in to any healing and recovery. So, practitioners speak of emotional balance or nurturing the spirit as part of holistic medicine. Materialism misunderstood people and life. The other materialism is the tendency to consider material possessions as primary and more important than anything else. He who has the most toys wins. For many years this was what people meant by our quality of life. And political analysts would say that an election turned on how the economy was doing and which party promised most material benefits and the greatest rise in standard of living. If I understand it rightly, this is now being questioned. The reason is that we have more possessions than ever and yet we realise it's not delivered the happiness it promised. Jesus called this the deceitfulness of wealth which will choke the word, making it unfruitful in your life. Parable of the Sower, Mark 4, verse 19. You seek it. You make sacrifices for it. You look after it. You call yourself a success for having lots of it. But distraction is dangerous, and only one can be top dog. Jesus said you cannot serve both God and money. Matthew 6, verse 24. Turned into a question, he asked, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Mark 8, verse 36. Well, the answer is no good at all. All you get is a temporary high which wrecks salvation. Being here today indicates that you reject the materialism that says there is no such thing as a soul. But we all, I think, struggle to some extent with the materialism that says wealth is central. So how should we cope as Christians in such a material world? I offer two helps. First, mastery. Wealth is morally neutral. It is a wretched master, blinding us to other things, but a useful servant as we think about serving the kingdom of God. If you can say no to opportunities to make money when they take you away from what is precious, then you're mastering it rather than it mastering you. So earn what you can, but guard what really matters, and don't overclutter it. Incidentally, you don't need to, lots of the stuff in order to be obsessed by it. The have-nots can be quite full of the idea too. 
first mastery and then also ministry. At the end of Peter's first letter, he tells church leaders, as we heard, that they must not be greedy for money, but eager to serve. And then Peter refers to the colleague who put his memories, Peter's memories, into gospel form when he sends greetings from my son Mark. The Gospels are a priceless gift to the world. Yet repeated surveys reveal that those who have more material resources give proportionately less to Gospel work than those without such wealth. Could it be that fewer things mean fewer cares, mean more time to help, which means more involvement, which means more ownership of what God is doing in your area? May our gracious God direct each of us as we review our giving this St Mark's time in a material but enslaved world, knowing that we're called to delight in God's goodness and to promise greater joys. Heavenly Father, may wealth and money not master us, and may the resources you give us be put to good use, that ministry and mission may flourish for your name's sake. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We pray for the church. Gracious God, have mercy on those who are serving you around the world. We think of Alison Giblet in Kiev with Church Mission Society and watch over those persecuted for the faith. We think of churches in around the Middle East with many areas mentioned in scripture or home to the earliest Christian missions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, ruler of nations, we pray for our world. We think of war zones such as Ukraine, Israel, Yemen and Syria 11 years into its own civil war. Asking Lord God for mercy, particularly on civilians caught in the conflict. Sovereign Lord, please bless and guide Charles our King, the royal family, Prime Minister and Government. And we pray for revival of the things of Christ in our land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for our community, loving Heavenly Father. Pray for the peace and prosperity of our parish. Remember the work of Bexhill Food Bank and Ukrainian guests living in our town. Pray for families and other loved ones, particularly the strays, to return to Christ. For all to know the joy of loving relationships, the protection of moral purity and the reward of serving you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we remember the sick in body, in mind, in spirit, and the carers. God of all consolation, we thank you for those who by your grace have run the race and kept the faith to the end. And we pray for comfort for those who mourn. Now, grateful to you for bearing us up on eagles' wings this past week, We offer ourselves in worship for the week ahead. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, 
we praise you for bringing us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that we fall into no sin, nor run into any kind of danger, but govern and guide us at all times, so that we may do what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, St Mark's tied letters being issued at church, and we thank God for the generous giving of his people. The second half of our hymn. In death's dark veil I fear no ill, with thee, dear Lord, beside me. Thy rod and staff my comfort still, thy cross before to guide me. Thou spreads the table in my sight, thy unction grace bestoweth, and oh what transport of delight from thy pure chalice floweth. And so, through all the length of days, thy goodness faileth never. Good shepherd, may I sing thy praise within thy house for ever. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your heart and mind in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and all whom you love, both near and far, and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for remaining in contact with St Mark's. Did I cough at all? Oh, praise God, maybe not. <laughs>